class and welcome to uh, chapter 38 vehicle extrication and special rescue lecture and after you complete this lesson and the related coursework you will be able to describe and apply in context EMS rescue operations to include vehicle extrication and its 10 phases. Additionally you will be able to describe various specialized components of the EMS operations to include tactical EMS trench rescue, high angle rescue, and the EMT's role in these operations. The safety aspects of these operations and um, are also discussed. So let's get started. Um, as an introduction, you will um, usually not be responsible for rescue. You may assist though um, with extrication. So rescue involves many different processes and environments. Rescue requires training beyond the EMT level. And this chapter covers the basic concepts of extrication so that you can function effectively as part of that team during the rescue incident. Um, extrication requires mental and physical preparation. Our priority is to provide patient care and personal safety and that of our team must be addressed before patient care can be initiated. So safety begins with the proper mindset and the proper personal protective gear. The equipment that you use and the gear that you wear will depend on the hazards you expect to encounter as well as what you observe during your scene size up. Protective gear may include turnout gear, helmets, hearing protection, fire extinguishers, blood and fluid impermeable gloves, leather gloves, or other disposable gloves. So vehicle safety systems. So vehicle safety systems can become hazards after collisions. Shock absorbing bumpers may be compressed or loaded following a front or rear end collision approach vehicles from the side. They can release and injure your knees and legs. Manufacturers are required to install supplemental restraints and, or airbags in all new cars. And airbags fill with a non-harmful gas on impact and quickly deflate after the crash. Airbags are located in the steering wheel and the dash in front of the passenger. Side impact airbags may be located in the doors or seats. An airbag should be deployed and deflated before you arrive, but non-deployed airbags may spontaneously inflate while you provide patient care. So maintain at least five, a five inch clearance around side impact airbags that have not deployed and maintain at least a 10 inch clearance around driver side airbags that have not deployed and then maintain at least a 20 inch clearance around passenger side airbags that have not deployed. Haze inside the vehicles in which the airbags have deployed is caused by cornstarch or talc and it's used to prevent minor skin irritations by reducing the friction between the occupant's skin and the airbag. Appropriate protective gear, including eye protection, will reduce the risk of eye or lung irritation from this substance. Okay, so we're going to talk about fundamentals of extrication next. And um, remember that your primary concern is for safety. Your primary roles are to provide emergency medical care and to prevent further injury to the patient. You may provide care as extrication goes on around you. Extrication is defined as the removal from entrapment or from a dangerous situation or position. Entrapment is defined as a condition in which a person is caught within a closed area with no way out or has a limb or other body part trapped. In the context of this chapter, extrication means the removal of a patient from a wrecked vehicle. Okay, and so this table shows the 10 phases of extrication, and we're going to discuss this. First, we're going to talk about the roles and responsibilities. So EMS providers are responsible for assessing and providing medical care, triaging and packaging patients, providing additional assessment and care as needed once a patient is removed, and providing transport to the emergency department. The rescue team is responsible for securing and stabilizing the vehicle, providing safe entrance and access to the patients, and extricating any patients. 
law enforcement officers are responsible for controlling traffic, maintaining order at the scene, and establishing and maintaining the perimeter. And the firefighters, they're responsible for extinguishing fire, preventing additional ignition, ensuring the scene is safe, and removing spilled fuel. Now, roles and responsibilities are often based on jurisdiction and available agencies. So good communication among team members and clear leaderships are essential to safe, efficient provision and proper emergency care. Okay, and so next we're going to start to go into the um, 10 phases of extrication. Okay. And the first one we're going to talk about is the preparation. And so preparation, preparing for an incident, requiring extrication involves pre-incident training with rescue personnel for the various types of rescue situations to which you might respond. Rescue personnel must routinely check the extrication tools and their response vehicles. Such preparations reduce the possibility of equipment failure at an emergency scene. Next is the en route to the scene. So procedures and safety precautions similar to those in the phases of an ambulance call are used when responding to the rescue incident. And next is the arrival and scene size up. So we need to remember to position the ambulance to block the scene from oncoming traffic. Use only essential warning lights because if we use too many lights, it tends to distract or confuse motorists. And many emergency responders have been injured on scene when they are struck by passing vehicles. We need to choose a location to park that allows safe access to the scene while leaving a way out. Do not park where you will be blocked in. We also need the position so that the back of the ambulance is pointing towards the scene to facilitate patient transport. At a hazard materials incident, we need to park uphill and upwind from the hazard. I'm going to repeat that. We need to park uphill and upwind from the hazard. We need to put on PPE and look for passing cars before exiting the vehicle. And we do not assume that motorists will heed our warning lights. We make sure that the scene is properly marked and protected. We request assistance from law enforcement, and they should ensure that the road is closed or that the traffic flow is diverted using cones, flares, or tape. Our job is to provide patient care, but we might be forced to direct traffic until the other units arrive. Scene size up is an ongoing process of information gathering and the scene evaluation to determine the appropriate stages um, and strategies and tactics to manage the emergency. Um, we need to pay attention to down electrical lines, perhaps leaking fluids or fire and broken glass. It's important to identify any additional resources that we might need. We may include, these may include additional units or other public safety personnel. We need to maintain situational awareness. It's the ability to recognize any possible issues and to act proactively to avoid a negative impact. We should evaluate the hazards and determine the number of patients doing a 360 walk around of the scene. We're looking for mechanism of injury, downed electrical lines or leaking fuels or fluids. We're looking for smoke or fire, broken glass, trapped or ejected patients. We're also looking for the number of patients and vehicles involved. And while looking at the vehicles involved in the motor vehicle collision, note the damage to the vehicles. Because remember, we could tell it by the mechanism of injury, such as a bent steering wheel may indicate significant face or thoracic trauma. Imprints on the dash may indicate lower extremity injuries, such as fractures and possible hip dislocations and fractures. And lift deployed, lift deployed airbags to see if there's deformity to the steering wheel or dashboard, which may indicate the patient struck the structure after the airbag deflated. Unrestrained patients may have contact injuries as well as secondary injuries. So check the windshield for spider web patterns of shattered glass indicating possible head, face, or neck injuries. Include findings in your documentation. Use the information to maintain a high index of suspicion. 
and evaluate the need for additional resources, such as extrication equipment or fire department, law enforcement, hazmat unit, utility company, advanced life support units, or air transport. Look for spilled fuels or other flammable substances. Sometimes post-crash fires are started when sparks ignite spilled fuel. An electrical short or damaged battery may also cause a post-crash fire. Rain, sleet, or snow can present a added hazard for rescue and crashes that occur on hills are harder to handle than that that occur on level ground. It increases potential for a vehicle rollover, it requires stabilization prior to gaining access, and conditions for the crash may cause other motorists to also lose control of their vehicles and injure you. Some crash scenes may present threats of violence, such as intoxicated people who are upset may pose a threat to you or others and be alert as always for weapons. So coordinate your efforts with rescue teams and law enforcement. Communicate with members of your rescue team throughout the extrication. Start talking to the incident commander as soon as you arrive. You become a member of the rescue team and you will enter the vehicle and provide care for the patients when approved by the incident commander. Okay, the next step is hazard control. So we've arrived on scene, we've done our scene size up, and now we're doing our hazard control. We're looking for and taking care of down. Electrical lines are a common hazard at vehicles crash scenes, and we're never gonna attempt to move down electrical lines. If power lines are close to the vehicle involved in the crash, we're gonna instruct the patient to remain in the vehicle until the power is shut off we need to remain in the safe zone outside of the danger zone. A hot zone is an area where the individuals can be exposed to sharp metal edges, broken glass, toxic substances, radiation, or explosions of hazardous materials. This is an illustration on the slide that displays the danger zone, which is also known as a hot zone. Okay, so hazard control. So family members and bystanders can also create hazards. The danger zone is off limits to those bystanders. You should keep them um, and help set up an area um, of this hazard zone and enforce that. The vehicle also could be a hazard. So an unsafe, unstable automobile on its side or roof can be a danger. Rescue personnel can stabilize um, the car with, relative, with a variety of jacks or cribbing. Ensure that the car is in park with the parking brake set and the ignition turned off. And both battery cables should be disconnected negative first to minimize the possibility of sparks or fire. Alternative fuel vehicles. So vehicles may be powered by electricity, um, and electricity gasoline hybrids or fuels such as propane, natural gas, methanol, or hydrogen. One common feature is the need for responders to disconnect the battery uh, to prevent further fire or explosion. In more than 40% of today's alternative fuel vehicles, the batteries are located in the trunk or under the seats, not in the engine compartment. There may be more than one battery present. Hybrid vehicle systems um, are, have a higher voltage than the traditional automotive batteries, and it may take up to 10 minutes for a high voltage system to de-energize after the main battery is turned off. So avoid high voltage cables. They're typically orange, and damaged high voltage batteries can give off toxic fumes. Do not approach the vehicle if an unusual odor is detected and retreat if you experience burning in your eyes or throat. Okay, so the next uh, section we're gonna talk about, that's the support operations. And so support operations include lighting the scene, establishing tool and equipment staging areas, marking helicopter landing zones. Um, fire and rescue personnel will uh, work together on these functions. 
Okay, and so the next uh, section we're going to talk about is gaining access. And gaining access to the patient is a critical phase of extrication. So you want to make sure that the vehicle is stable, the hazards are limited, uh, limited and controlled, and um, check the incident commander and enter the scene only after these conditions are met. The exact way to gain access to the patient depends on the situation. If it is up to you to identify the safest, most efficient way to gain access, um, if there are multiple patients, you should locate and rapidly triage each patient to determine who needs urgent care. This figure on the slide shows a motor vehicle collision. The exact way to gain access depends on many factors, including terrain, um, the way in which you, the vehicle is situated, and the weather. So to determine the exact location and position of the patient, consider the following questions. Is the patient in the vehicle or some other structure? Is the vehicle or structure severely damaged? What hazards exist that pose a risk to the patient and rescuers? And is the position, in what position is the vehicle? On what type of surface? And is the vehicle stable or is it apt to roll or tip? As patients' conditions change, you may have to change your course of action. Rapid vehicle extrication may be needed to quickly remove a patient if the environment is threatening or if the patient needs cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation is not effective if the patient is sitting upright. In, vehicle, in rapid vehicle extrication, you and your team may have to move a patient from side inside the vehicle to a supine position on a long backboard. A team of experienced EMTs should be able to perform a rapid extrication in one minute or less. During the assessment of an extrication phase, make sure the patient remains safe. And do this by a heavy fire resistant blanket. It can be used to protect the patient from breaking glass, fly, flying particles, tools, or other hazards. Also, a long backboard may be used to shield. Maintain good communication with the patient. Always describe what you are doing to do before it is being done, even if you think the patient is unresponsive. Try to keep heat, noise, and force to a minimum. This figure on the slide shows as EMS provider assessing the patient, always explain to the patient why you are there and what you are doing. Okay, so I'm going to talk about simple access next. Your first step is simple access. Try to get the patient as quickly and simply as possible without using any tools or breaking glass. And this is called simple access. Automobiles are built for easy entry and exit. It may be necessary to use forceful entry tools, however. The rescue team should provide the entrance you need to gain access to the patient. If the rescue team has not yet arrived, use tools like hammers, center punches, pry bars, or hacksaws. They should be available on the ambulance. Gain access by trying to use all doors, handles, or by rolling down the windows before breaking any windows or using other methods of forceful entry. Complex access. Uh, require special tools such as pneumatic or hydraulic devices. It requires special training. It also includes breaking windows or removing the roof. These advanced skills are typically performed by a specialized team. The figure on the slide shows the extrication process. It's a complex access, requires the use of pneumatic or hydraulic devices. Okay, in the next part phase we're going to talk about is the emergency care phase. And so um, providing emergency care to the patient who is trapped in a vehicle is essentially the same as for any other patient. Once entrance and access to the patient has been provided and the scene is safe, perform a primary assessment and provide care before further extrication begins. You're going to provide manual stabilization to protect the, cervi to protect the cervical spine as needed open the airway, provide high flow oxygen, assist or provide for adequate ventilation, control any significant external bleeding, treat for critical injuries, address life-threatening external hemorrhage before airway and breathing. 
removal of the patient is next. So rescue personnel should coordinate with you to determine the best removal route. Removal of a patient from a motor vehicle is a non-multi-step process that is intensive in terms of the number of rescue personnel involved, the equipment used, and the effort required to prevent further injury or harm. The table on this slide lists vehicle extrication techniques. So it, should, it talks about uh, you could brake uh, and gas pedal displacement, a dashboard roll up, door removal, roof opening and removal, seat displacement, steering column displacement, and steering wheel cutting. You should participate in the preparation for the patient removal. You need to determine how urgently the patient must be extricated. Determine where you should position um, would be determine where you should be positioned to best protect the patient. After the patient has been extricated, determine how you will move the patient to the backboard and then to the stretcher. Carefully examine trapped patients or limbs to determine the extent of the injury. If possible, evaluate sensation in the trapped area. Your input is essential to to the rescue team. Um, so reevaluate whether the patient needs rapid extrication. In most cases, it is impractical to apply uh, splints within the vehicle. Extremities, injuries can generally be supported and immobilized while the patient is being removed. Secure a fractured arm to the patient's side, secure a fractured leg to the other leg. Once the plan has been devised, you should determine the best way to protect the patient. Often you will be placed in the vehicle alongside the patient. Be sure to wear proper protective equipment. Your safety and the patient's safety are paramount. Appropriate hearing protection should also be worn. Okay, so transfer of the patient. Perform a complete primary assessment once the patient has been freed and any other previously inaccessible patients have been freed. Make certain that the spine is manually stabilized. Apply C collar if it has not already been done so, and move the patient in a series of smooth, slow, controlled steps with the designated stops to allow for repositioning and adjustments. Position each EMT for a smooth, controlled transfer. One person should be in charge of the move. Choose a path that requires the least manipulation of the patient and equipment. Ensure that everyone understands the steps and is ready. Move only the team, move only on the team leader's command. Move the patient as a unit, continue to protect the patient from any hazards, and once the patient has been placed on the stretcher, continue with the additional assessment and treatment that was deferred. The figure on the slide shows the management of the patient um, when caring during the extrication process. Once the patient has been assessed, rapidly assess the patient again and stabilize the spine um, manually and apply the cervical collar if it has not already been done so. Okay, then termination. So termination involves returning emergency units to service. All equipment used on the scene must be checked before reloading them onto the ambulance or apparatus. Uh, clean and check the ambulance uh, thoroughly, replacing use supplies, and rescue and medical units are required to complete all necessary reports. Specialized rescue situations. So sometimes a patient can be uh, reached only by teams trained in special technical uh, rescues. Special teams, uh, skills of these teams include the following. So cave rescues, confined space, cross field and trail rescue, dive rescue, missing person search and rescue, mine rescue, mountain, rock or ice climbing rescue, ski slope and cross country or trail snow rescue or structural collapse rescue. Special weapons and tactics, also known as SWAT team, technical rope, trench, or water and small craft rescue or white water rescue. Technical rescue situations um, require specialized teams and equipment to safely enter and move around and a situation may contain hidden dangers. It's not safe to include personnel who have not been trained. 
A technical rescue team is trained in on-call for certain types of technical rescues. And it's made up of individuals from one or more departments. And many departments of technical rescue groups are also trained as emergency medical responders or EMTs. So check with the incident commander to make sure the technical rescue group has been summoned and is en route. The incident commander is the individual who has overall command of the scene in the field. It's one member who must be clearly in charge. A lack of identifiable leadership at the scene hinders the rescue effort and patient care. The incident commander assessment will dictate how medical care, packaging, and transport will proceed. Customarily, the senior medical person takes the role. If no incident commander is present, follow local guidelines. When you arrive at a technical rescue scene, you will be directed or lead, led to a staging area. If the staging area is some distance from the ambulance, take a long backboard or the basket stretcher. Be sure to take all of your jump kits and other, any other medical equipment that you're gonna need to stabilize and treat the patient. Set up your equipment at the staging area um, or a stable location where you'll be able to treat the patient. Perform a primary assessment as soon as the rescue team brings the patient to you. Packaging and carrying the patient back to the ambulance is going to require a joint effort between EMTs and the technical team. Consider using an air medical unit if the patient will need to be carried or transported an extensive distance. So search and rescue. An air ambulance is usually summoned to the incident command post when a person is lost outdoors and a search effort is initiated. Your role is to stand by at the command post until the missing person or persons have been found. As soon as you are briefed on the situation, isolate and prepare the equipment you may need to carry to the person's location. So leave the prepared equipment in the back of the ambulance to protect it from the weather. You may be asked to stay with family members of the lost individual. So gather any medical history and communicate to those in charge. Only the incident commander should communicate any news or progress of the search to the family. So set your radio at a discrete volume. Once the missing person is found, you will be guided by the search personnel to the location where you can begin treatment. Time and effort can sometimes be decreased by relocating the ambulance or by using an all-terrain vehicle. Ensure the equipment is evenly distributed among persons providers. Ensure that the pace is maintained such that you can all stay together easily. Okay, so next we're going to talk about trench rescue. And many cave-ins and trench collapses have poor outcomes for the victims. Collapses usually involve large areas of falling debris that weigh approximately 100 pounds per cubic feet. Victims with thousands of pounds of dirt on their chest cannot fully expand their lungs and may become hypoxic. The risk of secondary collapse is also a concern to rescue personnel and EMTs. Safety measures can reduce the potential for injury. Responses vehicles should be parked at least 500 feet from the scene. All vehicles should be turned off to avoid secondary collapse caused by vibration. All road traffic should be diverted at least 500 feet safety, uh, a safety area. Other hazards include down electrical wires and broken wires or water lines. Construction equipment at the collapse site may be unstable and could fall into the cave-in or trench site. Witnesses to the incident should be identified. They may be valuable in providing information on the number of victims and their locations. Assist non-trap individuals from the area, and no time should medical or, or rescue personnel enter that trench deeper than four feet without proper shoring in place. During the extrication of any survivals, medical personnel trained in cave-in and trench collapse rescue will provide most medical care you should be prepared to receive patients once they have been extricated from the site. Okay, tactical emergency medical support. So there has been a steady increase in violence throughout the country 
and it has resulted in EMTs taking precautions to ensure personal safety. Normally, when the potential for violence exists, responding units should wait until the scene is secure by law enforcement officers. Sometimes a special weapons and tactics unit, such as a SWAT team, is needed to secure the area. These uh, include hostage incidents, barricaded subjects, snipers. Many communities have incorporated special trained EMTs, paramedics, nurses, and even physicians into SWAT units. They provide a special level of care to the sick and injured, and their training goes well beyond the practices seen in standard emergency medical care. So when called to the scene of a law enforcement tactical situation, determine the location of the command post and report this to the incident commander for instructions. Lights and sirens should be turned off and outside radio speakers should not be used nearing the scene. The command post is usually located in an area that cannot be seen by the subject and is out of the range of possible gunfire. You need to remain in this area. Planning measures are key in these situations, and they have uh, an incident commander identified the specific location of the incident. The incident commander should determine a safe location to meet up with SWAT members if an injury occurs and determine a safe route to this point. And designate primary and secondary helicopter landing zones if your region uses aeromedical evacuation. The quickest route to the closest hospital, burn center, and trauma center should be identified. Okay, so the next uh, next event we're going to rest special rescue we're going to talk about is structure fires, and in most areas, uh, an ambulance is uh, dispatched with a structure fire. A uh, fire is a house or other building is considered a structure fire, so determine whether any special unit is needed because of the fire. Ask the incident commander where the ambulance should be staged. The ambulance should be far enough away from the fire to be safe. It cannot block or hinder any arriving equipment. It, should, it cannot be blocked in. It should be close enough to be visible so that patients can be brought to it easily. Determine if there are any injured patients, whether you have been called to stand by. Um, a number of ambulances may be dispatched to the scene. Search and rescue in a burning building requires special training and equipment, and operations are performed by teams of firefighters wearing full turnout gear and self-contained breathing apparatus. They carry tools and hand, uh, hose lines. These teams will bring patients out of the building to the area where the ambulances are staged. So stay with the ambulance unless otherwise instructed. Other, uh, after the fire is out, do not leave the scene because you are, um, you may have to treat an injured firefighter. The ambulance should leave only if transporting a patient or if the incident commander has released it. And sometimes a scene may be further complicated by the presence of a hazmat, um, hazardous materials pose a threat to you and to uh, others at the scene, as well as a much larger area and population. So follow additional procedures outlined in Chapter 39, Incident Management. Okay, so that concludes um, the Chapter 38 Vehicle Extrication Special Rescue Chapter. Um, next uh, are the review, review questions, and I'm going to let you uh, finish those on your own. Thank you.